Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. We're going to start it, Peter. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a place to dialogue and cohere about what matters most at the nice edge of this moment. I'm Philip Chen. I'm going to MC for today. Um, and I'm super excited to have Forrest at the Stoa. Um, he's one of the delightful humans that I trust the most in the world. Um, he's a polymath, philosopher, writer, researcher, craftsman, a whole bunch of things. Um, but his most original work is, uh, his insightful work has been in metaphysics. So the study of what is, what is the nature of being, um, what is the nature of knowing, and what it means to make good choices. Um, his fundamental work, the imminent metaphysics, has influenced many. Um, many people know Jordan Hall, Dan Schmachtenberger. He also has a lot of kindred thoughts with other Stoic guests like Dave Snowden, Zach Stein, Tristan Harris. So really, Forrest doesn't make many uh, public appearances, so we're really in for a treat today. Um, he's gonna be sharing his thoughts on human collaboration. Um, so what's likely to happen for today, just as a brief kind of agenda so you can orient yourself, is he's gonna be talk for, Forrest will talk about for 15 to 30 minutes. And then afterwards, there'll be a Q&A where he'll be, he'll be answering your questions. So how the Q&A will work, just briefly, is if you have a question, you can write it in the chat box, and then I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question. Um, this whole session will be recorded, so if you want me to read your question, just indicate it when you write it down. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I want to pass it to Forrest to talk about human collaboration. Good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be invited to this forum. I've been actually looking forward to this. And um, definitely a lot of new faces and some people that I know and um, definitely uh, glad to uh, be speaking on these matters. So um, what I was going to talk about tonight or what I'm thinking, what I'm spending a lot of time thinking about in my life. Um, so the kind of work that I've been um, engaged with uh, these last few years basically has been centered around uh, what we would think of as chronic problems, uh, particularly uh, big, hairy, audacious chronic problems, the kind of things that uh, are complicated to such an extent that uh, we really couldn't expect a single person to learn every aspect of that problem in a lifetime, or that uh, really requires a variety of points of view uh, to even get uh, a sense as to what would be an appropriate response. Um, and so this, this kind of problem space shows up um, in things like existential risk, um, things that can be basically uh, really impactful on a, on a civilization scale. Um, and what would we be calling uh, long-term conscious sustainable evolution, i.e. what kinds of things would create uh, sort of a holistic thriving uh, on the part of the planet, ourselves as a species and an ecosystem um, in that context. So in effect, you know, when we, when we look at the kinds of governance systems that exist in the world today, they're mostly designed to respond to acute situations. Um, hospitals and police and, and uh, military and the kinds of um, congressional process, judicial process and so on, uh, for the most part are, are oriented around dealing with things as they come up. And so in effect, there's a, there's, there's a need for us to address chronic problems because as we develop technology to a larger and larger extent or we utilize it more um, you know, a larger portion of the world essentially deploys uh, computers and cell phones and automobiles and all the infrastructure that goes with all that stuff. Um, that in effect, there's this, there's this sort of rebalancing that is needed in the relationship between man, machine, and nature. Um, so in effect, we need to be able to think about problems in ways that are much more long-term than say uh, the next quarterly report um, or the kinds of things that would be done in a single election cycle. So in effect, there's a there's a, there's a phenomenon here of, you know, for the toolkit that civilization gives us, the kinds of ways in which it addresses uh, problems that exist. Uh, obviously, if the toolkit solves a problem, it's used and it's the problem, the, the problem solved. But if we had like a, a sort of collection of problems and some of them are solved by the toolkit and some of them are not, then over time there's this residual class of problems that the toolkit just doesn't address. 
And so uh, problems in that class have been accumulating for some time and are becoming quite important. So in address to that, um, most of the work that I've been doing has been thinking about, okay, well, what's gonna be needed in order to actually address those, that kind of problem, i.e. things that are very chronic, very complicated, um, what sort of facilities and resources would we need to have as a, as a human species to essentially be able to address things like that? So um, one of the things that, that we can start to do is we can start to say, okay, well, let's look at it as a co coordinated action problem. Like we have a, a group of people that wants to solve this particular issue. Um, and as, as I'm sure most of you know, that's not actually the easiest thing to do, uh, first of all, because people get involved in games of power. Um, there's a lot of uh, social dynamics that essentially emerge in that kind of space that actually makes it very difficult to do the kind of uh, problem solving exercises that are needed to, to address these issues. Um, we haven't as a, as, a, as a species really come up with a very good collective brainstorming system of capacity, um, you know, that, that, that can really address long term issues. So, in effect, what we, what we end up doing is we start to say, okay, well, insofar as we are looking at uh, the relationship between man, machine, and nature, then there's a kind of thing of, okay, well, how do we think about communities of action? How do we think about communities of sense making? And so immediately we start to notice that without sense making, without some capacity to know what needs to be done, that even if we had a really effective uh, way of um, responding, you know, some sort of, uh, so metaphorically, we could talk like a race car, right? So I could have a race car that has a really efficient engine, it's really powerful, um, it's got a, a really nice paint job, it looks, looks good, it's fuel efficient and all those kinds of things. But if the car is going in the wrong direction, it just doesn't matter. So in effect, there's a, there's, there's a sense of needing to know what to do in order to be able to uh, guide any process that would effectively inform collective action. So um, as a result of, 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 again, just sort of thinking about it that way, um, I've come to focus a lot on sense making. How do groups of people uh, collectively make sense of the world uh, to, to even just enable individual action, let alone collective action. So uh, a lot of the, the work that I've been doing recently is focused on sense making, specifically the kinds of things that would be needed for sense making and what sort of or, um, orientations would be needed to support that. Um, so, so that's kind of like, again, just orienting sort of the direction. The next sort of layer of this comes into the space of, okay, so if we have a community of people, say a town or or some, some motivated group, um, what would be the ways in which that um, sense-making process would happen? So in other words, if we're gonna put some sort of system in place or some sort of capacity in place or, or to create capacity in that group, um, then we need to start thinking about the kinds of agreements that would be in place to do that. Um, but that in, immediately lets us, um, encur encourages us to start thinking about, well, what is the infrastructure that supports agreements? Now, if I'm looking at a business, for example, you can think of a business entity as being like a collection of agreements. It's a, you know, it's, it's a employment contracts and vendor agreements and rent agreements and, and all sorts of legal documents one way or another that collectively form the corporation. But most people, you know, while the state might describe it that way, uh, most people don't think of a corporation as being a collection of agreements. They think of it actually as a collection of people um, and, and people that have capacities. You know, you might think about tools and, and capital and things like that. But but basically without some sort of relationship structure, uh, network of relationships, then you don't really have a company, you don't really have a community. So in effect, when we start thinking about the relationship between the network of agreements and the network of relationships, it becomes very clear that the uh, capacity to have agreements in, uh, in culture or in, in society, in any uh, organization, depends upon the robustness of the relationships. Um, if I make an agreement with my neighbor uh, to maintain the fence for the next six years, uh, but they move away in three months, uh, then the validity of the agreement just isn't that good. In other words, we, we really only have uh, capacity to trust the agreements to the degree that we trust the relationships. Um, and so when we start thinking about, okay, well, what kinds of network of relationships do we need uh, in order to really think about this um, as, a, um, as, as, a, as a capacity building for uh, sense making? Um, then, then we start to immediately start thinking about communications. Um, you know, when I think of a relationship with another person, I'm thinking about all of the communications that I've had with them, all the complete history of, of our interactions. And, um, you know, particularly for close relationships, I might also think about the potential communications I could have or the kinds of things we could do together. 
Um, so in other words, if you treat the, um, you know, just every moment of time, you know, every time I see them, I'm receiving messages in the form of what I see, but also what they say and, and so on and so forth, that uh, in effect, the, the content of relationship is the, is the total experience of the, of the communication that I have with, with, with each person in the, in the community. So then we start to think about sense making in terms of communication practices. Um, rather than thinking about it in terms of agreements or relationships directly, we're now talking about what are the kinds of communication practices that creates the capacity for sense making, particularly uh, capacity for sense making for big, hairy, audacious problems, because those are the kind of problems that we don't have the capacity to deal with very well currently. So, um, you know, this is basically just kind of giving an overview of, of, of some of my thinking around these things. And the, the idea here is, is that if we're going to actually um, work on the kinds of communications that enable sense making. When we, when we start to notice that certain things are, are really helpful, we really want to get into what is the fundamental nature of what allows for genuine communication to actually create sense making as a result. In other words, in what way does uh, reason or rationality or perspective or insight or an awareness of principles or wisdom um, result from uh, the, the, the very nature of the dialogue process or the very nature of the collaboration process. Um, so, so in that sense, I, I, I found myself becoming quite interested in collaboration as a practice um, and, and as a kind of art form as well. I, I, I began um, over, the, over this time to, to really uh, come to appreciate uh, conversation as an art form, dialogue as an art form, um, you know, really think about wit and the degree to which those kinds of um, interactive processes uh, emerge and, and, and evolve a, a capacity for perspective and insight and, and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, again, connected to this, this other body of work, uh, the, the metaphysics was mentioned, I was, I was given certain tools to think about this. Um, so for example, one of the insights that came from, from thinking about um, relationships and communication theory and information theory and things like that is that communication as a, as a process happens when each participant grants to the other participants. So say I'm just in a one-to-one -one conversation with another person, um, that, that each person grants to the other the right to speak, the right to be understood, and the right to know that they have been understood. And these are just given, they're not, they're not demanded. You can't, you can't ask for these things, but you can, you can give them voluntarily to your, to your partner and hopefully your partner will also give those same three rights to you. Um, and and that when that handshake happens, when each party gives the, the three to the other, um, then communication in this true sense becomes possible. So in effect, there's a, there's a kind of reciprocity that goes on, but it's not a reciprocity of quid pro quo of this for that. It's a kind of uh, mutual gifting, um, the, the sort of uh, economy that, uh, uh, Burning Man would, would sort of in, uh, encourage. So it's, it's, it's in that process that we, we can now actually have some sort of reciprocity that allows for a, a collective emergence, a kind of embodiment of wisdom to be shared between uh, two people and that, that that sharing process essentially emerges a, a, um, a, a new phenomena of wisdom because you can see from two points of view. So the, the idea of perspective taking starts to become really important. So that's why, um, you know, to grant to the other the right to be understood and for them to know that they've been understood is to essentially uh, to enable a capacity of um, something that in, 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 in some fields is called phase parallax. So for example, we have two eyeballs, right? And if I just cover up one, I'm going to see a two dimensional field of vision. If I basically have both, and what's happening is, is that these two two dimensional fields of information are being combined and in my brain. And this happens for everybody that has two eyeballs, basically, that, that work well. And that the emergence of a third dimension, like because I see two slightly different perspectives, I can effectively identify how far away something is. And it's, it's it partly by the separation. In other words, if they were in the same place, then I wouldn't be able to see from two different perspectives in such a way to get a sense by the triangulation from the two eyes, how far away it is. So in other words, if I just take and add two, two, two dimensional fields of information on top of one another, I'm still going to have a two dimensional field of information. But if I integrate the information, 
then I'm going to get this third dimension. I'm going to end up with this new capacity that emerges out of the combination of the two points of view. So in effect, when we're, when we're looking at communication as a process, it's not so much that we're just trying to advocate our point of view to the other person, that the other person is trying to convince us of their point of view. What we're really interested in doing is, is that each person is trying to see through the eyes of the other while also being able to see through their own eyes or see through the experience and the narrative of the other person, as well as the narrative that they themselves have. So that through the synthesis, not just the addition, but the synthesis of those two perspectives, that effectively a new dimension of insight becomes possible. Everybody in the world has a good story. They have the story of their lives, which is essentially a, a unique perspective. We all walk a, 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 our own unique path. And so in effect, what happens is, is that by being able to see from two perspectives, I can gain an insight into a situation through the depth of their experience combined with the depth of my experience. So there's a skill there to actually join those two capacities to do the perspective taking necessary to be able to ge genuinely walk in the other person's shoes without losing memory of my own state. And then obviously, if the other person is doing that as well, then, then there's an insight that they gain and now we can start to share those insights. So a meta level of insight becomes possible. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's in the um, ex experience of this that, 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 that we really begin to, to, to develop a deep love for conversation, a deep love for dialogue. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an opening that happens there. One of the other things that the metaphysics was given an awareness of is that um, joy is when there is, a, is an experience, it's a feeling that we have when we perceive an increase in the potentialities available to self. So when I can perceive these uh, deepenings these new these new insights then all of a sudden new possibilities emerge and that's usually a joyous experience because that uh, opening and expansiveness of, 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 of possible perspectives and, 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 and therefore possible actions um, is, 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 is something that we experience in a very beneficial way there's a, there's a, there's a moment of, of uh, joyousness in that process and so as a result there's a worthwhileness for engaging in the practice for its own sake not just for the outcome that it could produce so, you know, one of the things that, that, that has been sort of noticed along the same lines is that when we look at language, language has uh, basically three, um, three aspects of, of, of how it's uh, expressed. So I'm thinking from a linguistics perspective, particularly here. Um, we can use language to um, make statements such as I'm doing at this moment. I'm making certain claims. I'm saying, hey, this is some of the things I'm thinking about and this is some of the ways I'm thinking about them. Um, and those claims could be evaluated in, in various ways as, as maybe helpful or not. But um, we could issue directives. I could say something to somebody and say, hey, could you please get me a glass of water? Or, um, you know, would you shut the door? Or, or you know, we can give instructions to one another. Um, and then the third thing that we can do with language is that we can ask questions. And so when we, when we basically think about the kinds of roles that statements have, and the, the various characterizations. So at this point, we have three kinds of things we can do with language, three, three sort of uh, basic uh, coordinating intentionalities that sort of uh, subsume the space of, of, of all of the different things we can do with language, um, at least in, in, in one perspective. Um, then, then we can start to say, okay, well, what is the role of identity? What is the role of relationship? How do we think about um, the, the dynamics of what happens in an exchange uh, when, when one person makes a statement to the other? Uh, versus when one person makes a demand of another or when one person asks a question of another. Um, and, and so when we, when we look at that from the point of view of identity and egoic structures and things like that, we notice that um, when a person makes a claim, they have a little bit of their own identity tied into it, that they are saying X. And so uh, if a person challenges what they say, then, then you know, there's going to be a desire to defend that or to um, you know, try to con convince people that it's true and stuff like that. Um, if I'm basically uh, asking somebody to do something, there's also kind of egoic structure tied up in that in the sense of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to exercise authority or power or, or, or something like that to, to um, convince someone to shift their behavior on my behalf. Um, or maybe even on their behalf. Obviously, you can ask people to do things for their own benefit as well. But there's a, there's a capacity here where um, when we think about the relationship between self-identity and the communication process, and we, we think about questions, we notice questions are actually a little different in terms of their egoic identifications and statements and um, directives. When we're asking a question, we're, we're basically 
not so egoically tied up into it. I mean, it can be. I mean, for, for, for some people, there's this uh, sort of social cultural thing that, um, you know, to ask a question is to reveal a kind of weakness or to, um, then, you know, to admit that you don't know something is, is, is some cases, um, you know, socially uh, resisted a bit. But ultimately, when we, when we think about um, this in a, in a more transcultural way, or, or we, we will sort of factor out the, uh, the cultural aspects, and we're just looking at the egoic aspects, it's usually less the case that there is an egoic identification when asking a question. There's a kind of uh, intellectual humility that goes with that. And so if we're, if we're really encouraging sense-making fundamentally, then you know, when, we're, when we're looking at this phase parallax process of how do we gain insight and so on and so forth, well, immediately if, if, if two people are basically asking a question and both of them are in inquiry about something, then, then rather than you know, coming up against one another as, as would be the case with a statement or with, with directives, they turn and they, they're both sitting side by side and they're both looking out into the world to try to figure out what's going on. So if the, if the emphasis is sense making and the emphasis is uh, developing insight in this phase parallax process of being able to perceive from multiple perspectives or to be able to perceive questions from multiple dimensions, um, therefore becomes kind of a really important exercise. So in that sort of sense, I was led to sort of explore this phenomenon called ephemeral group process, which is um, how do we take small groups of people and create a kind of context and a container for them to explore questions, to essentially engage in an alternative dialogue process where we are effectively looking at how do we gain insights about something that matters, something that's important? Um, how do we engage the meaning seeking capacities uh, that we're all born with? And to, to sort of utilize that in, in service to community problem solving, community sense making. So on one hand, you know, we're looking at questions as part of the dynamic, we're looking at insight, we're looking at phase parallax, we're looking at perspective taking and the the kinds of things that would um, it facilitate high quality conversation and um, developing a series of, of techniques about how to encourage people and teach people how to engage in this, in this sort of uh, dialogue process. Um, so that represents essentially a, a, a body of work that, that, that's currently uh, being engaged with and, and that uh, we're, we're, we're actually seeking support to, to continue to do. Um, but the main thing is, is that there's a there's a need to sort of think about this in, in, in a larger scale too, because it's not just, you know, how do we help people who already want to be in conversation to solve a problem, um, to, to encourage them to do so in, in, in a genuine way that actually can work on the kinds of issues, the big, uh, hairy, audacious problems associated with things like uh, existential risk uh, and things of that matter. So, you know, on one hand, we, we, we can rely a little bit on the uh, evolutionary propensity that we all have to seek meaning, to see patterns, to, to look for things that are interesting. Uh, even uh, the, the, the most uh, rudimentary conversations, you know, you walk up to one of your friends and you say, hey, have you seen any good movies lately? You know, we're, we're, we're using the sense-making uh, capacity that the other person has, their perspectives to, to sort of identify, you know, what are interesting movies, what things stood out for them, what things did they think were particularly good or particularly um, interesting and worthwhile as a, as a, as a, as a you know, we could say entertainment, but, but an experience to have. And so, you know, if we, if we know what our friend is like and what they like and, and so on and so forth, then we can gain a perspective that, it, that essentially allows us to have more meaningful experiences in our lives, more uh, interesting and worthwhile experiences so that uh, the sort of um, wisdom seeking capacity is, 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 is still uh, kind of happening in the background regardless. But anyways, if, we, if we're looking at it from the point of view of, you know, what is the intentionality? Um, so remember, we mentioned uh, egoic structures a minute ago and we're saying, okay, well, if we're actually looking to solve big, hairy, audacious problems and we're, we're still wanting to sort of avoid the entanglements that, 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 that arise when, you know, large groups of people um, collect together um, the power structures that, that, that inevitably emerge, we need to actually start looking at the, the sort of uh, evolutionary dynamics that essentially result in human behavior, like what kinds of things like are, are built in that we can utilize to essentially do sense making, what kinds of propensities exist. Um, and, and so we, we, we kind of, you know, we need to understand the human condition really, really well to do work in this space. Um, and, and for several reasons, one of them is, is that obviously, um, you know, the, the human evolutionary pattern uh, drives a lot of our behavior, drives a lot of the biases in our thinking and so on and so forth. 
um, but it also creates the kind of motivations and the, and the motivational basis for us to engage in these kinds of activities. So there's there's good things to 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 know and, and other things that we need to be able to work around and 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 also a, a kind of recognition that while we can't necessarily change the human condition, we can work with it. And so, in effect, um, you know, when we're looking at the relationship between man, machine, and nature, and we're, we're essentially observing that, um, and, and Daniel has talked about this a bit, uh, you know, in some of his uh, podcasts and things. Um, and Daniel and Jordan, I'm, 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 not, I'm basically not trying to repeat things that they've already said, simply because, you know, we've been collaborating for some time and they've taken a fair bit of this content into the world already. But the idea here is, is that when we're looking at how do we essentially solve big big difficult problems that are that are very chronic, we need a, a sort of communication process that can work at scale without becoming entangled in the kind of biases and issues. Um, the, the, the power asymmetry structures that essentially uh, emerge directly out of the relationship between uh, machine process and uh, human process. So for example, um, when, you, when you look at evolutionary systems um, and ecosystems in particular, uh, conflict occurs in a context and the overall system itself is actually very much more cooperative. Um, there are certain uh, things that, 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 that occur in nature that are deeply, deeply cooperative processes. They're not necessarily obvious. Um, you know, when we, when we look at a system, it's easier to perceive the conflict than it is to perceive the cooperation. Um, and there's, there's metaphysical reasons why that's the case, um, having largely to do with uh, the very nature of the process itself. If there's uh, you know, an interruption of flow, then you're going to perceive where that interruption is happening because it's creating a, a, a sort of barrier of sorts and the barrier becomes an object that makes it possible to perceive it. Whereas things are flowing easily, then you can see through them. They, they become transparent. Um, there's a lot more I could say about those dynamics, but I just want to summarize roughly here. So anyways, the idea here is, is that cooperation is not only present and hard to see, but it's, but it's, it's actually the sort of context in which um, ecosystems essentially, the, the ecosystem creates this, this cooperative process. Um, and if there are interspecies conflict or intraspecies conflicts that occur, um, you know, for mate selection or things like that, that it's held in the larger container of the ecosystem. The ecosystem itself is uh, autopoetic uh, to a large degree. Whereas when we look at machine process, machine process doesn't presume a larger cooperative context. And so as a result, when we, when we are, are orienting around machine process, the, the nature of the asymmetry of power distributions that um, machine technology creates. That's my uh, clock going on in the background over there. <laughs> Anyways, um, that when we, when we look at um, you know, essentially a larger and larger proportion of machine usage, then effectively what happens is, is that the cooperative context of the ecosystem becomes destabilized. Um, I'm not just talking about issues associated with pollution. Um, I'm actually talking about the kinds of things that emerge existential risk fundamentally. Um, Daniel talks a lot about the generator functions of existential risk, and we can talk about uh, the kind of problem dynamics. There's lots of different ways to describe uh, fundamentally, what are the nature of the problems and, 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 and lots of different ways to describe it, each of which is comprehensive with, 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 within its own context. Um, I'm not going to try to go into all those statements here. Um, you know, the, the three of us have worked on that issue for some time and, and have actually come to some uh, pretty concise descriptions. But the idea here is, is that um, we want to basically be able to shift the relationship in the relationship, in the relationship between man, machine, and nature, because if we don't, then what ends up happening is, is that this destabilization of um, you know, man's relationship to nature and man's relationship to machines and machines relationship to nature such that nature suffers. Um, so effectively the, we're at 25 minutes, okay. Um, I'm gonna try to wrap up then. So essentially what happens is, is that the, um, the dynamic of cooperation that nature and um, ecosystems normally have needs to be resupported. So in other words, rather than having machines in service to man. We need machines to be in service to nature and, and, and to some extent man in service to machines so that it can be in service to nature. So that nature can provide the kind of ecosystem necessary to support life, i.e. our own included with that. Um, we have as a species the somewhat naive impression that uh, machines should serve us. And unfortunately um, that, that isn't working very well because of this uh, ecosystem destabilization issue. Um, so bringing it back down to a kind of human context, when we're looking at um, what is the relationship between man and machine, we're wanting to basically compensate for the biases that human beings have using the right level of technology. 
Um, unfortunately, the level of technology that is currently deployed is actually way extensive, way, way, way beyond what is needed in order to um, essentially correct for the biases of human process. Um, we want to essentially rework the relationship between those so that human beings can actually be in communication, do the sense-making so that they can actually be genuinely responsive to uh, the ecosystem in a holistic way. Um, one last point that I would, I would like to make in this context, which is actually pretty important, is that, uh, again, for similarly evolutionary reasons, we tend to think about communication as being in service to our own ends, to our own needs, uh, much the same way that uh, we think of machinery as being in service to our own needs. Um, so in effect, if, if we look at, you know, again, functions of communication from an evolutionary perspective, we see that it can be used for mate selection, uh, survival orientation process of one sort or another, um, and intergenerational knowledge transfer. Um, in effect, what happens is, is that uh, because of evolutionary process and particularly cultural process in the West, um, for a lot of historical reasons, which I, I don't think I have time to get into, um, there has been this great preponderance for us to think about communication as being an individual process, as if it was something that was to be in service to one's own end, one's own uh, you know, benefit, basically. Um, and really, if we're going to work on civilization scale issues, if we're going to work on existential risk issues, we actually need to think about our communication process as being in service to that larger need, i.e. thinking about things from an ecosystem perspective or from a species perspective or from a community perspective as a primary orientation rather than thinking about it as being for one's individual benefit or for one's local family or for one's just, you know, immediate um, context. So in other words, a lot, if, you, if you basically look at the internet, and you just grab a sample of, say, a million communications, and then you weight them on the basis of, um, is the orientation from which the, the, the person making the utterance, the author of the statement, uh, is doing so for their own personal benefit or for some expected benefit in the future to accrue to them uh, as a result of making that statement. You'll, feel, you'll see that uh, the overall preponderance is in favor of that rather than speaking on behalf of uh, a larger group or, or things like that. Not to say that that doesn't happen. I mean, obviously, you know, people do take altruistic actions. Um, you know, they, they, they speak up for the benefits of their community and they do speak up for the benefits of, of, of things like, um, you know, social welfare and things like that. But that in effect, we've, we've, when we look at the preponderance of behavior, it's largely on the side of the individual benefit and only occasionally on the side of altruistic benefit. Um, so in one sense, to, to really do sense making at a community level, we need to shift that balance to have it be a little bit more on the, on the community benefit side. Um, that needs to be done with a certain amount of, dis, you know, um, discernment, however, because, you know, people that operate just altruistically can be taken advantage of. Uh, there's a free rider problem and there's a lot of uh, issues where uh, people can extract value from that practice and essentially benefit uh, on a personal level uh, from, from essentially extracting value from the commons that was created by those actions. However, um, if, we, if we think about the dynamics of communication well and deeply enough and we think about the relationship between you know, again, that triangle of man, machine, and nature in an appropriate way, then it does become possible for us to compensate for those kinds of issues. Um, and this is largely what has been uh, on my mind and what I've been thinking about these last couple of years. So um, I guess with that summary, I'll leave it at that, uh, seeing as how I probably consumed way too much time already. And um, I'll just leave it open to questions and see what people are interested to know. All right. Thanks, Boris, for that nice overview. Um, I'm just going to say real quickly how the Q&A works again. Um, we are open to fielding questions in the chat box um, and then I will call upon you if uh, so you that you would unmute and ask your question. Obviously if this is recorded so if you want me to read your question just indicate it and I will write it down. Um, oh please indicate it when you write it down. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably start with a question myself. Um, yeah, I love that you took, started with these big hairy problems and then brought them down to communication is something that we can do and then moved it into EGP, which is your, something you're currently working on and then talked a little bit about bias. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask you a question around the social dynamics that you mentioned earlier around power and corruption and how kind of EGP thinks about that. That's a question that's been on my mind that I want to ask you in the projects that we work with, but also I think it would open up a lot of potential other questions as well. So the, the desire to seek prestige and to seek 
a, a certain amount of influence over one's environment um, to 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 effectively do these things. These are innate things. I mean, it's not, you know, it's it, it's not the intention here to say that this is fundamentally bad, but that, that in certain contexts, you know, it can be it can be overextended. So the the the, the aspect of technology uh, effectively leverages um, these these sort of relative uh, power over seeking uh, capacities on the part of individuals. It it, it makes the uh, uh, the wealth inequality distribution um, much more in, in, in unequal, you know, on, on fundamental metrics like that. Um, and again, there's lots of evidence to talk about and, and to support these perspectives. But the idea here is, is that if we're doing sense making, um, we need to not have those kinds of dynamics drive the process. So in effect, there's a, it, it, it's like if, if, if we're looking at uh, existential risk issues, then rather than mate selection, which is a relative communicative basis, um, we're actually talking about things on a survival basis, which is an absolute foundation. So in other words, to survive, you only need to actually solve the problem. You don't need to be something better than the next guy standing next to you. Um, so the, the difference between good enough to solve the problem versus better than everyone else in your particular uh, group, um, you know, in order to quote unquote win, uh, really makes a huge difference. If we're, if we're looking at uh, relative relationships as the basis of what we mean by success or what we mean by win-win, um, then it, 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 that's, that's just not actually the correct formulation of, of how to think about this. So in a, in a sense, when we're, when we're saying win-win solutions, we're talking about win-win in the sense of ultimate, ultimate underlying values, i.e. Uh, the idea is, is that values aren't something that's held on the part of an individual. It's something that is held by uh, essentially a collection of individuals. Meaning making, meaningfulness itself is not something which is a, an individual action either. Purposes can be individual, but meaning is, a, is, a, is an interpersonal phenomenon. I, I can you know, make up a word and say this word is defined as that thing, but unless other people essentially sort of go along with that, um, then, then it doesn't become part of language. So, you know, in, in a sense, there's, there's, there, there is a, a sort of idea here that nobody owns language. There's no uh, identity structures attached to language, particularly. I mean, there may be, um, you know, some, you know, like the French culture, for example, has a lot of uh, esteem with language, but, but fundamentally language is still a shared phenomenon. It's part of the culture rather than part of a particular person's identity. Um, so, in, so in that particular sense, when we're looking at, you know, what are the kinds of dynamics that facilitate sense-making, we're saying, okay, well, first of all, we want to have um, less asymmetry in the communication process. We want individuals to be talking to one another in a many-to-many -many relationship rather than uh, broadcast such that you have one person speaking and lots of people listening and there's not a uh, symmetry and um, you know, co-relatedness. Uh, the person who's doing the broadcast very rarely gets to understand the points of view of the people that he's talking to. And um, this is a, a loss, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not actually communication in, in the sense that uh, is needed. So in, in that particular sense, what we're, what we're really looking to do is, 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 is not so much say that, um, you know, the kinds of communication patterns that people would, would engage with in the business world are wrong. It's just to simply say, we need to create a different context. And so um, one aspect of that is not to have broadcast, but essentially to have small groups, uh, not to have it a, a, you know, be defined in terms of, of statement making or directive uh, making, but actually defined in terms of questions, um, to have it be uh, much more about perspective taking rather than about agreements. And so there's, there's a lot of specific dynamics that are kind of built into the EGP process. Some of them, you know, they look obvious on, on the surface, but there's, there's actually a lot of subtlety involved in that. It's, 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 there's, a, there's a tremendous richness of thinking that has gone into this and that, um, and not just on, on, on my part, there's a, there's a lot of people that are collaborating around this now. So um, in effect, there's a, there's, there's a real richness of, of what on the surface looks to be simple practices, but the emphasis is not so much in terms of simplicity as it is clarity. So the, the, the clearer the communication process, the, the, the more in which we can essentially have people really think into one another in a collaborative way, uh, the, the more likely that the uh, emergence of uh, solutions to big, hairy, audacious problems become possible. Um, just looking through all the questions right now. Um, so I would like to start off with a question from Reed. Can you unmute and ask your question? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for doing this, Forrest. 
Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned those three principles um, for productive sense-making dialogue. And I was wondering just what other kind of low-hanging fruit there might be, like nonviolent communication or steel manning or other kinds of elements that we could introduce that uh, would be productive. Oh, there's a lot. Um, nonviolent communication is a good start. Um, when I look at the nonviolent communication thing, I, I notice that there's a couple of elements that I would add. Um, one of them is a, is a kind of affirmation um, to, to, to really basically um, you know, connect to the other person and to say, hey, there's, there's something really beautiful there. Um, so the, the validation piece is important. And then the question asking piece. Um, there, there really wasn't something explicitly said in, in um, uh, the, the, the sort of four uh, core elements of nonviolent communication that, it, that allowed for inquiry to really be a thing. Um, this, and, and, th and those are minor things. And, and, and the idea here is, is that, you know, those are, those, that's, that's one slice of good practice. Um, another good practice is to sometimes be aware or to, to really focus on the awareness around uh, what we would have as an action bias. So many times people will ask, how do I do something? And while in, 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 in the world where we're living, that's actually a very good bias to have to be able to execute and solve problems. Um, sometimes it's important for us to stand back and ask a what question. What does success look like? How would we recognize it, right? So in other words, the, the what part of the question drives the how, but if we just go directly to how and we, we lose sight of the, of, the, of the why question and the what question, and particularly the what question, um, then, then to some extent, we, we, we actually might be, as I mentioned with the metaphor of the car, we might have a grand car, it might be a race car with absolute co complete capabilities, but, but if it's solving the wrong problem, then it, then it just isn't, isn't the right thing. So in effect, the, um, the other uh, principle that uh, I, I think has, has been mentioned, uh, I, I believe this one's Jordan's, uh, you know, the Omega principle, i.e. presume that the other person has something worthwhile to say, that they're, they're, they're doing their best to, to communicate something that's meaningful and important. Um, and this is true even in an adversarial context. Um, that you know the the values that the other person has is there's there's a grain of truth in, in whatever it is that they're valuing, and that there's a there's a sense of there's no fundamental value conflicts. I mean, we we sometimes get into this perspective of well, I value A and this other person values B, but you can actually value both A and B. There's no mutual exclusivity that's required there. Um, you know, unless people are really trying to construct it that particular, but that that really doesn't happen that way as a as a natural phenomenon, it, it happens as a constructed one um, that, that, that effectively values naturally can co-occur. So there's a, there's a sense here of, you know, communication's hard. Like in, in any given moment, the amount of vocal bandwidth that I have to, to convey ideas is about 42 bits per second. It's just not very much. You know, when, when we're looking at computers and such like that, that are, you know, speaking back and forth with one another at megabytes per second or gigabytes per second, it's like, you know, the, 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 the actual available inter-brain communication bandwidth is, is, is appallingly low. Um, and the bandwidth of consciousness itself as a phenomenon is, is, is not very high either. So, you know, for us to, to really leverage this wonderful nervous system that we have and the miraculousness of life, we need to actually rely on unconscious process quite a bit. And so in effect, there's a, uh, there's a need for us to take some things for granted with the other in the sense of really working with them to search out the meaningfulness. Um, you know, when, 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 when any one person says something to someone else, it's, it's, it's very easy to do this stupid, obvious thing to point out the, the false parts, the parts that you don't agree with, the parts that don't make sense. But it really requires a, a much higher level of skillfulness to basically say, okay, I want to reach through the inside of all that and find out what is the grain of truth that, that, that is really genuinely important, is genuinely insightful, that really speaks to meaningfulness or values or the sacred. And so, you know, when we, when we give that sort of willingness to, to hear the inside of the message, to really seek out the, the parts that are the beautiful principles underneath it all, then the communication process can move forward in a far more dynamic way than, than would otherwise be the case. Um, and, and, and another principle is, is, is basically to recognize when, you know, we're looking at an adversarial conversation versus a, 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 a mutual cooperative one. I mean, a lot of times people I mean, at least for myself, I mean, we could we either get into the habit of assuming cooperation, which, which I tend to do, or we're into the habit of assuming adversarialness, which I know some other people do. And, and, and again, there's not a right or wrong here, but it's, 
it's a little bit of a thing of if it's a, if, if you're making the wrong assumption as to the to the nature of the conversation, then then you're not communicating very well. And 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 that's this is basically to observe that both have their place. Um, you know, if we're if we're looking at a, a jury trial uh, type of situation where it's important for us to get to the right answer, I mean, people's lives depend upon the sort of sense making process that a that a jury trial is. You know, you you want all of the sensing capacities to to be engaged in the, in the, in the yes it's an adversarial process but on the other hand you know to, to really look at it with enough dimension to really identify what is what is the deep truth of what's happening here is is actually really important um, sometimes you know the, the adversarial conversation provides a way for the deeper values to be identified and to be, and to be uh, brought forward in a productive way hopefully we have that shift from an adversarial context to a cooperative one but if we mistake which conversation we're in or what the intentions are, what matters to the other person, because we're not paying attention, um, or we just presume that they don't have anything interesting to say, then, then, then we've kind of missed the point. So, you know, in, in, in that situation, I'm, I'm, I'm basically looking at, you know, a lot of different principles that, that sort of involve um, things that would enable deep communication to occur. Um, you know, getting into the kinds of exercises that allow you to do perspective taking on the, on the part of the other, to really put yourselves in the shoes of the other, that's a huge skill. And, and not very many people get into that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if there's, if there's something that you want to do to essentially become a better communicator, that's, that's, that's a, by far a strong thing to do. Somewhat tangentially, um, Natalia, could you ask your question? Not live. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not going to go in video. Uh, can't where I am. But um, the question is essentially, how do you get groups of people who usually do not engage one another, who might not have the opportunity to engage one another, uh, nevertheless, to have more clear uh, communication that could lead to something more generative and solutions oriented, but they might not be exposed to one another to begin with. They might not have that invite to start. Well, I think that uh, there's there's a lot of work going on in this space. I, I don't know that I would be adding anything original, but um, you know, to, to bring all the stakeholders into the conversation and to essentially help them to engage with one another, um, there's a lot of human development stuff that's that's really helpful. Um, so, for example, um, you know, if people are in a traumatized state and they don't have any way of dealing with their own personal trauma, um, then then they're just going to have a hard time communicating at all. So, in effect, there's a there's a sense of you know, how do we increase individual health? How do we, how do we help people to um, essentially, uh, you know, develop the skills of, of, of socialization that, that would essentially allow them to, to communicate well and deeply with one another? Uh, occasionally, that means just meeting needs, you know, make, making sure that needs are met. Um, but, but in, in, you know, once, once you get sort of past the, the rudimentary kinds of things, um, you know, creating a, a, an environment which is essentially conducive to this process. So, you might start with provisional agreements for the meeting that is actually happening after you've created the invitation. You might need to give certain assurances to the people that are, are coming into that context that, that they are safe in that context in, in, in specific ways. Um, you might need to basically do things to ensure that other people don't leverage the concept of safety itself as a kind of weapon. Um, you might want to get really good at recognizing what weaponization is. You know, what does weaponized communication look like and how do you basically do the kinds of practices that, 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 that aren't about that, that, that effectively emerge from that. So you have to recognize what that looks like. Um, any, anything that is essentially uh, the use of causation to suppress choice is, 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 is going to be somewhat suspect in that, in that particular way. So the idea here is, is that you know, there's, there's a lot of different ingredients that all need to work together in order to create the context where people are actually communicating with one another. Fortunately, the human biology provides some support for this process, but uh, you know, given the, the technology that's involved and so on and so forth, there's, there's a need for us to essentially become much more skillful about these particular things uh, than we ever have as a species uh, previously or that nature has ever needed to before. Uh, for a lot of the problems that we're looking at, there's a, there's a need for us to be far more discerning about these practices because evolution hasn't prepared us for the kinds of needs and demands that are currently placed on the human species vis-a-vis uh, -vis its, its now technological capabilities. Um, you know, power of gods and all that sort of thing. So, so at this particular juncture, just to try to sum up a, an answer to your question, um, but first of all, it's not a single thing. It's a whole bunch of practices that all kind of work together in concert. 
Um, and there's a lot of really good work going on in this field. And, 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 and so all I can really do at this point is just give you just kind of the outlines of the summary. All right, so I wanted to, we have about seven minutes left. I um, want to end off potentially on uh, probably your most famous quote. So, um, Angela, would you like to unmute? Hey, Forrest. Um, I came across your quote. Um, Love is that which enables choice. Love is always stronger than fear. Always choose on the basis of love. Um, and I looked you up thinking you were like a Terrence McKenna number two, and I was surprised to see you. So I'm curious where this came from, if you wanted to unpack that for us. Uh, sure. Well, it's, 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 it's a quote that, that, that I, I, I put together as, uh, what is the single most succinct and useful in a, in a life sense? Uh, you know, if, if, if I had to condense, um, I mean, obviously, I can't hold all of the, the things that I've learned in life, but, but, but if I were to pick the single most useful learning, the single most useful wisdom, um, that, that was really what came to mind. The idea of love is that which enables choice is, is, is partly a description of what love is. Like, how do we know that we are being loving to another person? What is the litmus test that allows us to distinguish between we think we're being loving versus we're actually being cruel? Um, or, um, you know, the other person says that they love us, but we're not feeling the love and, and, and we might want to need it or, or need a tool to un understand why there's a difference between what they say they're doing and what we're feeling. So in effect, the idea behind love is that which enables choice is essentially a kind of, um, it, it, it's not based upon the feeling of love, it's based upon the action. What does it mean to do it? And so, you know, one sort of parable that I, that I described to, to, to convey this and, and give a sense of it is that, you know, say I'm in, in, in a partnership with a woman and, you know, I'm wanting her to feel love from me. In other words, I'm wanting to enable her in her life to realize her dreams, to become more fully and completely herself, to become the best and brightest and most brilliant person she can be. And in that process of her becoming that, then I can know her better and I can understand the miraculousness of her life in a, in a deeper, more felt sense. And so in a, in a, in a way, it's, it's that I'm not trying to make choices for her because if I, if I substitute her choices with mine, then I don't ever get to experience who she is. I'm not actually in relationship to her. I'm only in relationship to the image of myself that I put in her. So in effect, there's, a, there's, there's, there's some really deep truths tied to this. I mean, when we're looking at, say, uh, child raising, for example, you know, when they're born, they have no capacity to choose on their own part. I mean, they are, they're literally completely dependent on the parents. Um, and then, you know, they get to uh, whatever adulthood is and they move out or we die. And at some point, we can't make any choices on their behalf. And if they're going to continue to live well in life, you know, to continue to, to, to be healthy uh, human beings, then we have this sort of transition from uh, at, at T0 of, of making 100% of their choices to, you know, T100 and we're, we're, we're passing on and they're making 100% of their own choices. And there's this sort of gradation between those two where in effect, the, the intention here is not to make the choices on behalf of the child forever, but to teach it how to choose well and fully, how to live well and fully, how to have wisdom in his choices so that it can be discerning about what's actually right to do. And then anything less than that means that we've effectively created a damaged human being that isn't capable of living their own lives in a complete way. So this notion of intergenerational knowledge transfer, this intergenerational capacity is 100% enabling. It's it's not for the benefit of the previous generation, it's completely for the benefit of the receiving one. And so in effect, what's happening is, is that we, we recognize that that as a, as a core idea is the very meaning of what it means to love our children. You know, when we look at say a government relationship, you know, the state and the people, the, 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 the function of a government is to protect the land and the people. And that's a basic function. I mean, you know, to some extent there's a, there's a need for that. But the idea here is, is that if we wanna go beyond that, if we wanna to go to the land and the people that are thriving. We need to go beyond protection and just making people feel safe. We actually want to go to the space of that the that the ecosystem, that the that the holistic health and vitality of, of the people in the land are is increasing, that the ecosystem is becoming essentially a more robust, more meaningful space to live in. 
And so even in that sense, we're seeing this notion of enables choice, right? So it isn't just, you know, that we want a minimal government and a maximum marketplace, because neither of those in this case is, is adequate to uh, some of the problems we're facing. We actually need more than that. And so in effect, there's a, there's a, there's a recognition here that the notion of love is that which enables choice, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not just at an individual level, but at a community level, at a species level, at an ecosystem level. And that the, the notion of meaningfulness and sacredness and so on and so forth is, is not something that's taken, it's something that's given. I think that's all I can say about that right now. Awesome. I think that's a great way to end off the session. Um, uh, thank you very much, Forrest, for coming and gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Peter, for providing the space and giving me the opportunity to MC the session. And thanks for everybody for coming here and uh, showing up and asking all your great questions. Um, yeah, I think I personally learned uh, that love and friendship and uh, communications are the basis of what we need to do moving forward. Um, and yeah, I did want to say that there plug one event for tomorrow, roughly in the subject, um, how to win friends and influence people during the meta crisis with Kevin Crone tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, so you can sign up there at the stoa.ca. Um, yeah, that's it for tonight. And thanks everybody for showing up. Thank you very much, blessings. Thanks, Forrest. Thanks, everyone.